Hello. Hello, how are you? Hey, how are you? How's it going? I'm doing well. I survived the day. Yeah. How was the day? It's been a good day. It's a long day as, as these days have been as we prepare for the class coming, uh, that's coming in. Uh huh. And of course, all the adaptations that we can do because of the pandemic as well. Okay, cool. Uh, well, thank you for your time. Good to be uh, here. We'll just wait for a few more people to come in. Could you, could you, in the figure, could you grab me a water? Could be one of the fizzy water, any water. Something. How much? How much time you have? How much time we have? I think I think they give us forty minutes, forty five, forty minutes. Okay. So, okay. All right. Cool. Uh, if you need more, let me know. All right. Cool. So when when does uh when does school start back up? Cool. Officially, the students come back on the second week of August, which will be the twelfth, uh -huh. so mid August. Um, which is pretty soon. We're not that far, three weeks. Okay. So all the staff all the staff start coming back in now? The staff are here. The faculty are probably not here. Many of the staff in student affairs and admissions uh, are here. Public safety, of course, the normal things that run the campus are here. We also have summer programs, so some faculty are here. Other faculty are doing research both here and elsewhere. So they're here, but they're not in classrooms, many of them. Right now. Okay. All right. Well, you ready to get started? Yes, I am. Okay. Well, first and foremost, uh, thank you uh, for agreeing to do this interview. And uh, we have uh, President uh, Barrett here of mm -hmm. Xavier University of Louisiana, which I am an alumni, alumni, alumnus. Um, so uh, thanks again. And I just have I just have a list of questions, but um, you know I'm sure we'll we'll maybe we'll get off topic a little bit, but uh, let's just go ahead and start. And how about we just start by um, just tell us how how's your how's your experience been so far, Xavier? Uh, so far, it's been now. Uh, uh, when people speak of me as a new president, I'm not new anymore. I feel new and slightly used. It's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, Xavier is very much a home and very close to my heart. Um, mm -hmm. We've had to change many things. We've had to put new things in place, uh, do some things differently than before because circumstances change. Uh, but what we find a consistent, a constant, is the commitment of people to the mission, especially our faculty, who are uh, committed to making sure these kids are graduating and graduate at the highest level. That means some great flexibility. And I think that's been one of the things that actually got us through the pandemic in a good way, that this faculty that was able to go the extra mile because it was in their nature because uh, to make sure students got the education they deserved, no matter what the circumstances were. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I guess coming in uh, behind Dr. Francis, who had been there for so long, um, and then I, I think me personally, I, f I feel like a lot of the alumni, um, you know, people get kind of used to things going a certain way. And so um, I'm sure that probably could have, that may have been a, a challenge for you, but. Um, it, over, was, it was in a bit, but not an overwhelming challenge. Right. So I would say you, you've been there for at least six years now. Yes. So in your first six years, uh, what would you consider some of your biggest accomplishments? Well, uh, clearly, uh, there were financial hurdles that we had to, and some of the financial issues were existential. 
Mm -hmm. We had, because of Katrina, we had, we owed a little more than $150 million in debt from our recovery from, uh, to, from Katrina. And that was, if we could not find a way of resolving that, would mean that we would have to do less and mm -hmm. struggle and not be able to, not have the freedom to grow and expand and do the things that we needed to do. So I think that biggest challenge was actually to actually resolve that loan and to get that loan, have that loan forgiven by the federal government, which actually liberated Xavier in a big way. And at, at that moment, we were able to, to begin to look at what do we do, not just in deferred maintenance, but by building new programs as well. That was uh, probably day one of my arrival that, 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 that we had to actually say, this is not something that we can look away from. Right. And what about like uh, challenges? Um, since you like, what, what were some of the-, the well, uh, I, just gave, I just gave you a major, the, the other challenge was actually to, to begin to think about things that we had to modernize that included our, our core curriculum. Uh -huh. our, general, our general our gen ed curriculum at Xavier, which was a barrier in some ways to uh, transfer students coming to Xavier because it was such a large number of, it was probably at least, at least the general ed curriculum was, was half of the required credits at least. And that was a barrier to students who were transferring from other students so we were not attracting transfer students. Right. Uh, the gen ed curriculum, we, the faculty, we, I encourage the faculty to actually begin to sit down with the provost to, re to review the, the gen ed curriculum and basically uh, modernize the gen ed curriculum to bring it into the size range into the 30, 40 uh, credit hour range. And they were able to do that. And that was somewhat surprising given that my experience is actually reviewing, revising gen ed curricula in my previous life at other institutions was that it was uh, a bone of contention among faculty removing courses and things like that because you're taking a course from my department from that. Right. That was, that, was, that was a very difficult issue. Comparable to, I would say, Congress addressing Social Security, which is a oh, wow. discuss. <laughs> but, is that big of a deal? Yes, it was that big a deal because, remember, it is ownership of, of part of a basic education of liberal arts education. But what oppressed me is that what normally would take two, three, maybe years at many institutions, they were able to come to a consensus of what that should be in a year, less than a year, year and, and, and a few months. Mm -hmm. and, Part of their focus, and I, and I remember these conversations as the they faculty were voting on it, it was about what do the students need? It wasn't about what does my department need? <laughs> that said something about, about the faculty that were able to accomplish that. And as a result of that, that's where you're beginning to see, you've seen some growth in the numbers of, of transfer students and we've been able to enter into articulation agreements with community college systems, even as far as California, because Xavier becomes transfer friendly. That was the, the, that, in fact, that academic hurdle was an important hurdle for us to actually be able to actually create time for students to begin to take electives because the students, many students did not have time to take electives because they had to finish those courses. Right. It's by times to put another area of knowledge within your bag of tricks about that you take into your life's work. And that was an important piece for educationally for Xavier students. We were able to do that. Other challenges we had to, uh, well, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you think, if you think of, 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 of what we have to do recently in the pandemic, but before that, it was even to actually begin to think about our res modernizing our residential spaces, which we begin to do some work on uh, uh, the, 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 the dormitories and the residential facilities that, that that's, you may have lived in St. Michael's, I'm sure, right? Uh, well, I was I was a local, so I local, so you did not have the pleasure. But but I'm but I'm I'm familiar with. You're familiar with it, and could use it could use an uplift, right? Yeah, it definitely could use an uplift. Like it probably needed an uplift when you were there too. So some some of those challenges of being able to have the funds to do that, resolving our loan to the federal government was actually an important part of freeing us to be able to begin to do that uh, in our master planning process, which we are, which we are doing right now in our master planning. I think the. Great things that we were able to do also was to, were to bring new programs to Xavier that, that we have not had. For example, Xavier has the only undergraduate neuroscience program that we need in HBCU right now, the BS okay. program. What we've been able to do uh, in, 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 in new programs, not just in the, in, in the, in the social science type, like, uh, but also what we are doing in the arts, what we are, well, what we are doing in, 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 data, in data science, and also the new graduate programs that are coming on Xavier uh, uh, in, in, in some in some health fields, for example, not just we have we have the, the the EDD in education, but also what you're seeing is the MA is a master's in physician assistantship, and what you're seeing is that our students are playing an important role 
in bring new representation and diversification within fields that where, where there's low representation of, of students of color, which means something that as we were developing this program, we had been discussing, but as we went into the pandemic, the idea of representation and trust became a major issue. Right. <laughs> and these programs Absolutely. that we've begun and are continuing to grow will be, is our, is our service to the larger community. Okay. Um, you, you bring up the pandemic. Uh, so let's, let's maybe go back a little bit, like the, when a pandemic started, um, how, how were you preparing for the pandemic? Like how did, how was Xavier able to, to make it through the pandemic? Xavier made it, uh, uh, understanding that one of the key elements of navigating the pandemic is understanding that you are navigating through uncertainty. You'd never have full knowledge of what is around the corner. Right. But you can actually make educated estimations based upon what you rely upon your knowledge of this, not just the public health and the sciences, but also human, uh, uh, human behavior. Uh, but what we did at Xavier, I think, and somewhat because of my back of my experience as a scientist, especially in, in, uh, in immunology and, 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 and biochemistry, I read certain press. Mm -hmm. And what occurred in early January, if you think in early January, the news of the first illnesses in Wuhan began to percolate, maybe as you were getting on your plane around the New Year's. <laughs> right. But later in the month, February was later, something, something important happened that, 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 that spiked my attention. We saw the first cases that appeared in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. And I said, oh, this is SARS. We had gone through SARS. This is breakout from China. What we did was that at Xavier and no one, and many of my colleagues in, uh, at Xavier were surprised that I asked for this, but also outside, no one was paying attention to this in the same way. We called together the entire cabinet, but also the direct report that had to do with planning and this is to, to set up a scenario planning session. So the last week of January, we did a scenario planning session. And the question, we only did one question. If this virus that we had just seen break out of China showed up on our shores, could we continue education for our students in any effective way? Right. What, do we, what can we do well and what don't we have ready? Mm -hmm. So the scenario planning session, which lasted an entire day, breakout groups on student life. How do you feed students? Oh, how do you monitor health? How do you deliver programs and services, the education, education of a quality that, that we would be, that we, we demand of ourselves? And, begin, and, and that breakdown began to understand what we could do and what we could not do. And if we, those things that we could not do, what do we need to make those things happen? For example, the, what we did in early February was to begin to begin um, essentially boot camps for faculty members. Some of our faculty were very fluent in using uh, remote learning modules because they've been doing it. Right. Others were not. Others were, it was, they may have done, put their, put their courses and grades in the system, but they, re, they rarely taught a class in the system. So those boot camps began saying, how do we do intensive training? And we continued that through the, through the spring break. Uh, we also began uh, asking ourselves exactly, if we had to go away, what would be the gaps? For example, the gaps that many of our students, as we learned later, did not have computers. Or if they had computers at home, they did not have efficient, efficient internet. So we would reserve funds to actually send out um, hotspots, and which we right. did with FedEx. Uh -huh. So when we actually pulled the button in early March to say, this, the school is, we are sending everyone home, right? We began executing that plan that we began working out for that scenario planning session. And in some ways, we were very early in doing this because uh, we worried enough that it could happen. And I understand that our call for the scenario plan, my call for the scenario planning session was, became prescient because about two weeks later, we received a note that we had two faculty members who were in China, who were coming back. Oh, wow. And then we were saying like that, okay, they come back. What do we do? Right. Then we began talking about what is the quarantine plan? How long should they be quarantined? Uh, so those issues came, uh, we didn't have much time to actually figure out the playbook. So some of this, when I speak of working through uncertainty, sometimes we had to build a ship while we were, while we were, while we were rowing. Right. No, I get it. Yeah, and I, I, I guess with your, your background, that, that probably helped out a lot. Um, what about uh, moving forward? A uh, couple of questions. 
what are your thoughts of about uh, mandatory vaccines for for students? I think uh, first of all, we have already asked uh, required mandatory vaccines for students, except for the exceptions that are required by law, uh -huh. medical exceptions, and also certain religious exceptions. Right, required by law, but we are, we are mandating vaccines. I might reverse your question if I may, and not to be impertinent. Uh, what do you think about the right to infect somebody else? I'm sorry, repeat that? What do you think, do we have, does each of us have a right to infect somebody else? Uh, that's a great question. Else? That's the real question. <laughs> because what we're saying is that at Xavier, and I think that's one of the things that protected us, that I think our ethos as not just historically black and Catholic, was that we, we are beholden to each other. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we began to see masking, you were not just masking in the early days to protect yourself, because we're not sure that masking would protect you. Right. But the data was that masking would, kept, kept, would keep you from infecting someone else. Right. So you're doing it so that you are not a danger to someone else. That's what we did. And Xavier students and faculty accepted that quite well. Right. Uh, that notion of uh, we are requiring mandatory vaccination because of good science. Once is that uh, right now, 99.5% of all people dying of COVID-19 or going to the hospital of COVID-19 are the unvaccinated. So now the pandemic has become something about the unvaccinated so that it's a very dangerous thing not to be vaccinated. Right. At the same time, you're able to transmit as, a, as an unvaccinated person to those few people who are vaccinated but are not protected because they're immunocompromised. They have effective immune systems. There are some of us who, who are like that, are mm -hmm. immunocompromised they should not be in danger. Right. So unless there is a good medical reason why you should not be vaccinated, your duty and responsibility to your neighbor is to be vaccinated. Okay. All so right. that? so uh, for the upcoming year, is there any consideration or is there, is there a possibility, let's say I'm a student and I really don't feel comfortable being back on the campus? Is there, is there options for, for, for There will be some options, some courses that maybe, that, that there are some, some courses that, that will be doing at a distance, but not at the same level and scope as we had last year. Okay. Uh, so the option of having a full curriculum depends on the, on the field and the major and what year you're in. Okay. So I, I would not answer that as a university question that, that any student who wishes to stay home would have a full, a full schedule. I could, not, I could not guarantee that. Okay. And what, 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 what are your, as a, as a scientist, what are your thoughts of the, the COVID? Do you, do, you think, do you think it is under control? Do you think it's going to get worse? Not under control. Not under control because if you just look at even, even in this state, but also in other states nearby much more intensely, uh, what you begin to see is, 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 a, is a rise in illness with a new variant, which is much more transmissible compared mm -hmm. at least almost twice as more tr as transmissible as the one that emerged in, in, in March of last year. Mm -hmm. So it moves more quickly. In other words, remember when they used to say that 15 minutes is the outside in the presence of someone who's infected, right? Right. It's probably now five to seven minutes. <laughs> okay? With, with, with the new event. And this is probably because that's not been measured very well. But the, the transmissibility is much, is much greater. What you're seeing is that many people who are, un who are unvaccinated, the vaccine is, being, is spreading much more rapidly through that population. We have right. less than half. So that, and what you're seeing is that something is happening which did not occur in the spring, last spring. You're beginning to see some serious effects in hospitalization among younger people. We don't fully understand what's going on there. But clearly, it, if you ask me, are we done with COVID? The answer is we're not done with COVID. We could be done with COVID if we had 80% of the population vaccinated. Right. But, but since, we, since we have, let's put it this way, since we have politicized our best defense mm -hmm. against the uh, pandemic, right? We're going to lose some lives unnecessarily. Right. Okay. All right. Well, let's switch topics. So I'm a big... Um... I'm big in sports. Like I love sports, basketball. You, what sport you, play? you split? You play here? No, I didn't play there. So I didn't play at Xavier because um, I would have walked on, but I didn't even try out. But I probably should have played. I probably, I, I probably could have got Xavier a few championships during my time. Now, 
I may still, am, do I still have some eligible? you still play. Am I still eligible? No, no, do you still play? Yeah, well, actually, I kind of gave up because I'm a plastic surgeon, and when I go out and play with these young kids. You don't want to break these fingers, yeah, man. They, yeah, yeah, they, 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 they <laughs> And so I just, I just gave it up. I just gave it up. But I will tell you this, when I moved to Atlanta, the first, uh, I used to live in downtown Decatur. I actually coached the freshman team at, at the high school because I'm, I'm that passionate about basketball. But I might give you a quick anecdote, a quick story about myself. I Go ahead, soccer. tell me, let's hear it. I played soccer in college. I played soccer, okay. in college. and I played soccer even afterwards. I, I would play pick up and also on club teams when I, when I was in grad school. When I came to Xavier, there were there were some games and competitions at Xavier. And one game that I played, there was a team of faculty and staff against students against, and the, different departments. And on one of those games, I blew my uh, Achilles. Uh, 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 my, it's uh, always the Achilles. And, no, no, and, and, and I blew, blew the tendon, right? And it took me a while to realize what I'd done to myself because, you know, dumb and stupid, it'll, it'll get better, it get better. A few days later, I should, see, I should see someone. But to this day, Father Atito feels guilty because he asked me to play. I said, Father, it wasn't you. You didn't do it, right? You feel guilty. And then I said, can I play again? He said, no, the president cannot play. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm I not play anymore. That's that's a that's a recurring theme. Like once you get past, I'll say like 35, 38, like playing sports, it becomes it becomes. And you sexual. still think, and you still think you're fifteen or eighteen. Yeah, and it's always the Achilles, always the Achilles. But what I wanted to kind of like talk about is, you know, when I was at Xavier, the only uh, sport I remember them having was maybe basketball. They may have had tennis at the time, but now. Um, scrolling through my my Instagram or I'm on a website. Volleyball, um, compete, baseball. You're competing in baseball, volleyball, uh, the basketball teams winning championships. You're moving up divisions. Like where did, like how did this all come about? Like what what's what's really going on? Like we are we, are we trying to go D1? The answer is no. We're not going D1. And probably not for at least Probably never, but uh, I think the reason is because uh, many of students who come here have a love for their sports, okay? And Xavier, that you've been, you should pay attention to also that these are really scholar athletes. When, for example, the uh, center for the basketball team uh, three years ago was finishing law school, but he was considering his uh, go going for MPH when he finished playing basketball, okay? Mm -hmm. That's not unusual at Xavier. Right. Or, 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 or women from uh, uh, telling her coach she cannot come to play for this playoff game because she's making a presentation at the national meeting of her paper. That's Xavier. So they are scholar athletes, okay? So the idea of, uh, if you look at the Grace Mary, remember Sister Grace Mary? Yes. Yes, yeah, Sister Grace Mary, uh, the honor roll is named after her. Uh, and, and the honor roll, the number of Xavier students who are on, 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 uh, athletes who are 3.0 athletes. It keeps growing, okay. So, but the idea is that uh, we educate students who actually have a love for their sports and also have, uh, and, and, and it's important that we're educating the whole person. If you don't think of the old Latin st states saying, men sana in corpore sano, healthy mind, healthy body, right? Right. These students love their sports. There are other students who love other things as well. And so it, 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 it's part of that. Uh, we are, we want to compete at the same time all of our ADs and coaches understand that the first thing is about getting a student to get their degree and be able to go to what they do, want to do. Every once in a while, we may have someone who becomes the great, a great tennis star or a great basketball player. But that's not, the goal is education and, educa and educating the whole person. So mm -hmm. we want to have the, 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 the range of sports that our students can engage in. In fact, soccer will be coming to Xavier very soon because many, many young people are of, of at least of my son's generation, probably your sons, are playing, are playing soccer, right? Right. So soccer will, uh, uh, is coming at Xavier as well. Um, and so, how, but how, what? I'm sorry. I Go was ahead. Like, how, how, do, how, how do you think the athletic or a, a flourishing athletic department kind of benefits the university in grand scheme of things? Well, it, it, it benefits us uh, reputationally, but also it attracts, it, it attracts certain students who would not have come to Xavier if they could not become a pharmacist and still play volleyball. Right. 
You said, right. they asked you, for example, it's the same way that I would say, if I'm a clarinetist, right? I don't uh -huh. want to, I like playing the clarinet, right? And the fact that there's an opportunity to play the clarinet while I'm becoming a chemist or historian, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can choose this school versus the other school, right? right. So the idea that, because many, many of our talented young women and men haven't played sports uh, and enjoy their sports. For example, one of the sports, one of the, that's becoming competitive and actually we won, we actually went pretty far, is, is our competitive cheer team. Uh -huh. Many of our students who had cheered while they were in high school, right, are coming to Zay because they want to cheer. And the first, few, the first two years of cheer team, the team, uh, uh, we, we've gone to finals. So uh, not, that I, that, not that that was in the plan, but these students came here because they want to do this as well. And so what, what, what do you attribute the, the success to? Like typically, just from my, you know, my experience with sports, like usually when you develop these programs, it usually takes some time before they kind of like mature and you, you start winning. Like why has it been, how, how, how have you been able to attain success in such a short period of time? Coaches, great students. Great coaches, great students. And how do you get the great students? How, how do you compete with other HBCUs or uh, PWIs to, to get, I mean, you're all competing for the same uh, pool of applicants. How, how are we able to compete? The one thing that we are able to do is to tell our story and we don't have to make it up here. We tell our true story and, we, and one thing that, one of the challenges that I had coming in as the new president was that Xavier was doing great things, right? Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, I would get a letter on my desk. For example, there was a gentleman who sent me very, uh, I won't mention his name, but a uh, very, very uh, wealthy individual, sent me a check code of $30,000. Uh -huh. It showed up on my, on, on my desk somewhere around this time, maybe five o'clock in the afternoon, the office was empty. I opened it, I looked at it, it's a check, and a note. And he said, I read this article about Xavier. I'd never heard about you. And then he had this strange impression because he was coming from the North. He said, I never knew there was anything good in Louisiana until I read this, okay. And he sent me this check. So I picked up my phone, I called him and his wife answered the phone. And she said, oh, let me call my husband. He, we were talking about this, so we said that she said, we're reading about you. We had to let you know that we noticed you. But, but then he asked, and at the end of this call, you know what he said to me? What, what surprised me? How come I never heard about you? Wow. Ah. When that happens to you once or twice, you say like, remember that movie Field of Dream? You think they know about you, but they don't know about you. But right. no one, because you know about you. The mm -hmm. <laughs> person next to you knows about you. But the people who really need to know about you may not know about you. So we had, we did a lot of work, if I remember, um, to really get our story out. Branding is brands, marketing is brands. Yes, I with you is to make sure people knew about us who did not know about us. Right. And, and, and very often it's the mother or father or grandmother of a young man or a young woman who's about considering college in their junior year, right? Who needs to hear about Xavier. So like, so have you considered Xavier? For example, this is, and I'm not bragging because it's just a fact. If you go to one of their, I'll take one of the very good four year colleges outside of Philadelphia. I won't mention the name, okay? Okay. Or, 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 but you know, you can pick on the, the ones I would think about. Uh, excellent for your college. They send their graduates to some of the best graduate schools in the other. If you are pre-med and you want to get to medical school, and you go to one of those schools, or you come to Xavier, the likelihood of you getting to where you want to be at Xavier is much greater. No brag, just fact. Right. But nobody knows about that. <laughs> well, a lot of people. So do. It, it's my fault, it's our fault for not making sure they, they, they didn't hear about us. Right. True. So, so we, work, we worked hard at that, and we've been telling that story. Uh, the stories of high expectations of Xavier, that we have our faculty embrace us with very high expectations, and basically those are, that's a challenge that says that you'll discover the things that are your weaknesses early because the fact we are going to confront you with it, and then they'll tell helps you. Now let's work on this to make sure that you're not that that, that you will be ready when, when you leave. That's been a constant of this faculty. The other thing that's the world needs to hear about is that if you think about the the the, the Xavier country to, to, to economic and social equity, through social mobility, the fact that Xavier, when one looks at 
all American colleges and universities, and the studies that were done by the, by the Higher Education Research Institute in, Ca in California and others as well, other studies looking at social mobility. When they look at universities for students who are in the lowest quintile of the socioeconomic bracket, their families are, who when they finish school within five years, migrate into the upper three-fifths. And they look at, and when one listed the top 10, it was written up in the New York Times and in the Wall Street Journal as well. When they listed the top 10 universities in that study, right? Mm -hmm. Xavier was six in the nation. And sadly, and I say sadly, we are the only school in that list of top 10s in, in the Southeast, in the Southeastern states. What right. I the, what I call the old confederacy. You know the old confederacy. People probably, most people probably don't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, and, 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 but we've been telling that story to make sure people understand. We've been promoting that. And now I'm telling you, and then you should tell everyone you speak to about it. But that's the kind of, so when, I, when, we, when we speak to families, also friends, people also recommend others to consider Xavier. We must, they must hear that basically at, your, at Xavier, we push you, you accomplish, and you will be transformed. And that story is quite true. Some others doing branding and marketing at other universities, they may have to make up their stories. Right. We don't have to make it up because it's we just facts. have to say, this it's is all it. Facts. Yeah. So I, 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 just fact. I like, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think the athletic department, all of that's all part of the creation. And the fact that our, that, our, that our athletes, they graduate. Right. They're scholar athletes. And they're winning. For their years. Uh, that's a piece, that's a story that, uh, for example, one, our baseball team, our, our latest one, I think that's uh, your, your, your fellow Atlanta who passed away just recently, Hank Aaron, had been pushing, nudging us for many years. What are you going to do about baseball? What are you going to do about baseball? And he's been working with us. And he passed away only weeks before our first game. God wow. bless him. Hank yeah. has been a friend of Xavier. Uh, the Sultan of Swat looked to see how we made sure that there are... African American athletes coming out of HBCUs. One kid, one young man who comes, who in our first team, right, was mm -hmm. already accepted by several other teams, recruited by other coaches, and he was planning to go to a school in Alabama to play. And he heard about the Xavier baseball team. He calls us, "Are you still? Is this true that there's going to be a baseball team in Xavier?" When I when I spoke with him at the first game, after him, he said, "What?" I said, "Why did you choose Xavier?" He said, "Like, my goal is to become a surgeon." I heard you had a baseball team. I said, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a no-brainer. But, but that, that, that option, so do you understand that it's, it's our athletics. It's also our academics. It's even also the, the culture of service. I would say that you were pre-med here, that there's almost a marine ethos that basically we don't leave any man or woman on the field. Right. We support each other. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, speaking of, of which, uh, so, you know, most people, when they think of Xavier, they think of pharmacy and pre-med. What, 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 what kind of efforts are being taken to kind of open up the market or open up the school to, to those other yeah. academic programs? We've been one of the, in fact, if you, if you meet my prov the provost of the university, who herself comes from modern languages. I am a scientist. It's important that we actually, we've been, we have a concern to actually grow the non-sciences at Xavier, mm -hmm. uh, non-STEM fields. So we've been doing much, for example, if you look at what's happening in MassCom, but also what's, even our neuroscience program was to actually leverage something between the social science, and behavior, between the behavioral sciences and the life sciences. It has taken off. What we, it took off very quickly. But also what we're doing in, in, in data science, moving what is computer science tends to be hardware and software directly, right? Where data right. science is a, is a field which has applications clearly in health, but also clearly in business. Mm -hmm. Has applications in, in any of the social sciences for in any of the, what I call the population sciences, mm -hmm. including public health. <laughs> so the data science program is growing is, is, is growing between that, but also in the pure humanities, what you're seeing, the digital humanities initiative that we've put together, Xavier, with some funding from the Mellon Foundation is, 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 now, is, is, now, is now established at Xavier, but also moving forward in what we're doing in the arts. And we'll be doing something at the graduate level, actually, in, in curation, especially of African, of African 
uh, of work of, of art from what I call the larger African diaspora. Uh, from, I think by that, the African diaspora I'm saying from Africa, Tierra del Fuego, up to Nova Scotia. Okay. So we are so we are doing things that are not just in the sciences, but also what you're seeing is that there's an ability to leverage things that actually, not assuming that this, they, they are hard borders between the, the STEM fields and, 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 and humanities and the arts. For example, a mine in bioethics, which I'm pushing, I'm, I'm judging and trying to create a full major in bioethics, right? In, in non -bi I shouldn't say bioethics, in ethics, in ethics of science and, and, and health, right? Right. It's really between ethics is really grounded in the social, in, 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 the, in, the, in the humanities, in philosophy, and also in, 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 in theology and also in social sciences, right. which is not experienced in, in the sciences, but it really creates a bridge between those fields for students who actually see themselves doing both. And even in our pre-medical program, in our conversations with some of the uh, medical schools, the pathway for students who are majoring in, in the humanities who want to go to medical school, especially as we've been in conversation with Mount Sinai's track for students who are coming from the humanities and the arts in medical school. We've been having conversations with, with, with Dr. Butts and others as well. Uh, as to how we, we allow and create tracks of students who, who may want to major in the uh, in, in the humanities but want to go to medical school. Right. Okay. So we, we, we are growing, but clearly I think it's, there's also a national understanding as well of the value of those fields that, 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 that we have to work with, which doesn't begin just in Xavier. Right. So on that same token, how do we continue to be how do how do how do we ensure that Xavier remains uh, preeminent uh, pre medical uh, undergrad uh, for 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 students as well as uh, for for pharmacy school? Well, I think part of it, part of it is to make sure of the the level of our educational infrastructure. Uh -huh. the professors, the classes we teach, and how, and, and, and how we, mentor, we mentor students, but right. also to create pipelines for students to understand why uh, the pipelines before they come, they, they, before they, they aspire to college. We have, we have some work that we have to do outside of Xavier. Right. We encourage students to understand what their pathways are, even to help their parents. But some of the, the other pieces that, that are important actually is, is, is monetary. That given that the communities from which we are drawing students are some of the poorest communities in the United States. There's almost a five-fold uh, five differential between, uh, in wealth between African-American families and, and, and the and majority families. These are not wealthy students, so we need to help them afford education at Xavier. That even though our tuition at this point is about two-thirds that of our, 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 our peers nationally, I mean, those great uh -huh. colleges, uh, Xavier, Xavier is considered one of the best uh, educational bodies in, in this country by, 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 by the Princeton Review. Even then, it's a hard slog for many families who are not wealthy. So right. we need to increase our endowment, to have endowment to actually be able to support need-based uh, uh, scholarships, not just scholarships for the students who have stratospheric ACTs or ICTs, right? But right. for that good student who has a 2.8, 3.0, right? Right. Who deserves Xavier education and should be supported. And so, how do how how do how do we how do how do how do you get the alumni to be more active? Like I, I, I mean, for most of my my time after after I you know graduated, I was studying, and I I mean I was broke. I, I couldn't really. Mm, those first few years after school, those are not your years. Your 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 biggest giving years. It takes a while. It really, it really takes a while. And then I didn't, I mean, like, I, I mean, as a student, you don't like homecoming really, I, it didn't really mean much to me. Like until I graduated and I came back years later, you get to see all those people that you went to school with. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's like a family reunion. I think part one is that you see the results of the education by looking at those you went to school and graduate and see what Xavier did to them. They right. Failed. Now, I guess the communication with the alumni is also to allow them to see and engage with the students who are currently here, those who are just, just graduating, to see that they are 
the promise of this new generation, this new uh, cohort generation of students coming through. And that communication of seeing those successes is that we have work to do to communicate to the alumni and communicate to the larger alumni community because not every alumni, alumni uh, in, at your stage of the career, folk are busy. <laughs> Right, yeah. Like busy. Busy. You don't have, but so we have to get information to you to say exactly, right now, for example, the fact that we have a um, uh, number of students who are going off to their PhD programs in neuroscience, in, in chemistry, who are then going off to uh, interesting uh, medical schools, uh, we need to let to, to sh help share those success and those stories because that encourages the alumni to think about that. How do I support that? I mean, we also need to be very prescriptive as to how you can be helpful in, in, in modest ways and eventually in larger ways. Right. Because, for uh, example, the way that we even, the emergency fund that, 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 that we created for really with one narrow focus to say, we want students in their third or fourth year who are in good academic standing, who are challenged by something. My father lost their job, uh, many things, you know, a major, uh, a major catastrophe that uh, they are community students, but their car is dead. Right. Uh, whatever those things that may become a barrier to their finishing, because getting close to finishing is not is is not good. Right. Getting right off the finish line is good. So how do we get them over the finish line to say that there's there's room for modest giving, either to give love and others to fill that emergency fund that allows us to actually meet those needs to make sure that we don't lose that young woman or man. Uh, that's so there are way, there are other things that we can do that are. That are small but grow that, that, that grow into large that, that grow into large collectively into larger efforts. The other piece that we need to do is that we need your help as alumni, and I'm talking about collectively, to find our lost sheep. People go off in places and they're out of, they're, they've been out of contact with Xavier. We don't even have a good email up for them sometimes. Right. <laughs> because they're in huh, South Dakota, wherever I'm, I'm, I'm picking a place. It could be New Jersey for all I know. But the idea is that how do we actually, but we meet each other at airports. We run, into, we run into friends eventually, right? To actually help us get back into contact with our lost sisters and brothers. So there are many major efforts because collectively the alumni are an important giving and also not just giving, but also they tell our story in places where we cannot be. Right. So we yes. need to so share the stories like the social mobility piece that you say you didn't hear about. We need to share that with you so that when you are in some place, somewhere, you tell our story. Right. This is very true. And I, I, think, I think one thing from my, my personal experience is the communication, like keeping the, there, there has to be a connection between the alumni and the university and the alumni and the students. Like I, me personally, for example, I have ran into a couple of students who were pre-med and he reached out to me via social media and mm -hmm. said, hey, doc, can I come and uh, shadow you? So one student, student started, um, his name's Ramel. Ramel's actually about to start medical school at, uh, at, at, at Drew. And so what he did is he then told another student, now this other student isn't a Xavier, uh, Xavier undergrad, but nevertheless, she, I mean, she goes to Howard. So she, she came. She reached out to you. Yeah, she reached out to me because she knew him. And it's kind of just started a cycle. And now I even have, I have a kid who is currently a surgical tech that wants to go to med school. And <laughs> he just, just from being in the room, he realized how much more uh, Ramel was prepared to go into medical school because everything was in place for him. And so basically, uh, the other student is just kind of duplicating what he did. And, and, and part of that is also that uh, Ramel got, got, was pushed at Xavier in ways that not every student gets pushed because the assumption that when a faculty member sees you, or young you at Xavier, right? They act like they do believe in you and they act mm -hmm. accordingly. <laughs> Right. So, yeah. so if you're slipping, they will push you. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, cool. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I think I have a few more questions and I'll, I'm not going to take up much more of your time. 
So since you've been in New Orleans, um, I just want to know, I mean, you can't be in New Orleans and not love the food. Give me, give me, give me, give me four of your favorite, four of your favorite restaurants. Oh, New restaurants. Oh. There's a new restaurant that just opened about hey, six weeks ago, Fritai. Uh, this young man who had opened a stand uh, in the St. Rock's Market in his uh -huh. dream. This kid's from uh, Boston. He had opened a, a stand in the St. Rock Market about four years ago. And uh -huh. his dream of opened a restaurant. He finally opened the restaurant. It's really good. You should try. Fritai Thun Basin. Okay. Um, Thun Basin Street. There's a, there's a, a Tunisian restaurant on Maple called Jamila's Cafe. Uh, it's to die for if you like lamb and anything and, 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 and tagines. It's that good. And it turns out, I remember when I went there one, one day early, this was several years ago, and we we're talking, eventually I noticed that the owner speaks French, we we're speaking French, and, he mentions it, and I mentioned him, and Xavier said, Oh, my son is a third year student in pharmacy, and Xavier. <laughs> and so uh, it's, it's, it's that good. Uh, I love Dookie Chase. It still breaks my heart because I miss Leah when I go there. Uh -huh. but it's still good. Um, another one that that I'll say that if you go to there's a Vietnamese fusion place called Cafe Min off Canal. Okay. Off so Canal. It's worth Cafe Min is actually it's a, it's not Vietnamese per se. It's it mixes a lot of the, remember, New Orleans is about those, those traditions kind of just do this. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you'll see this. Uh, good restaurants is a good restaurants in New Orleans, but I can't say favorite restaurants because I, I, I don't repeat very often. I come back in maybe six months. Okay. Uh, a, lot good, a lot of good restaurants here. Okay. I got you. Um, all right, this this is gonna be my last a couple couple more questions. So, um, president of, of a university, President Xavier University of Louisiana. What's what's like a typical day like? Like, what, what's your day? What's your day like? Uh, typical day. There are some scheduled meetings, but then there are also uh, meetings to make decisions on on, on on things that are emerging. Like, mm -hmm. um, it could be that. Because there, as I screen, my, as I scan my email very often early in the morning, there might be a student, a student concern, would come to me as a CC, but then I'll, I need to check and make sure that it was followed up on. Right. So that's my early email. I'll scan my email, and I scan my email several times a day. Don't assume that if you send me an email at ten o'clock in the morning that you'll, you'll be answered at ten thirty, because it may not be until two o'clock then that I go back to my email. Uh, so email uh, and making sure that that we're not missing anything, but also. Meeting and having conversation with some of my uh, team sometimes because we will, we will meet, discuss situations that, that, that we're planning. A lot of that is also coordinating to make sure that sometimes many of the things that, are, that we're concerned about require input from several sectors of the university, for example. Same way that we talked about, I think, testing for COVID, right? Right. Required IT. IT played a big role in making sure that we had the testing lab running. Uh, it's not, it, wasn't, it wasn't just the the, the faculty in pharmacy and biology who were playing that key role. So they were, they were, they were they, and, and there was really a student health piece from student affairs that had to teach how, how we get students tested and the logistics of, of, get, of having it done. So many pieces. So we're having conversations across to make sure that the, uh, and so I, I want to hear that we're making those progress, that progress. The other piece that during the last year, a lot of it has been reviewing our situation to make sure that basically we're, we're, we're adapting and changing things that, 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 that we may need to do. For example, do we, uh, it's, not, it's about our policies. Do we, use, do, do we actually need more resources because uh, the pace of testing is not getting us fast enough? So making decisions as to how we adapt has, has been important. A lot of that, but a lot of that is also hearing from my staff of where are the emerging challenges that, 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 that we're facing. Some of them may be curricular. Some of them may be um, we're missing enough staffing to answer our phones and as we're getting students back in. Uh, those are things that we're tracking as we go. 
and prepare for emerging. Um, our, our facility is going to be ready in time. Those are things I need to hear about because in three weeks, the kids are here. So mm -hmm. uh, their time, I also find that I need time if I need to write something where I'll tell my staff, I say, unless there's a fire or something horrible is happening, I'm closing my door for two hours. Okay. Wow, you can close your door for two hours. That's, that's pretty impressive. And that doesn't happen often, but basically sometimes if I need to write something, I need time away. Okay. All right, cool. Well, and sometimes um, my, one of our, our former students, Mark Veal, tells me I have to do an Instagram with you. Tell yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, I just sent you an email. And, and I have to tell you, Mark, who's, who's actually doing, uh, coordinating all, the, all this, was a student here only three or two years and ago. And Mark, Mark, did Mark re respond to that email or you personally responded to that email? I think the email, I first passed it on to uh, uh, Ms. Reyes in, communica in our communications team. Say, okay. Let me make sure, because I don't own my schedule. I'm not allowed to schedule myself. I'm gonna schedule. I see that. I see they, that. They, they, they don't let me play with dangerous toys. <laughs> I got it. I got it. So, um, last question. Um, who, who do you have winning, winning uh, the NBA Finals? Uh, actually, I can't say. I haven't been paying enough attention to it. Okay. I, I know the Bucks lost, and, I, and, and, and Atlanta, I'm sorry to hear Atlanta is, is not going well. well, well. I, I don't care about Atlanta. I'm from New Orleans. You want me from New Orleans? And, and, I, and, 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 and I'm torn because the Knicks and, and the Nets are playing. I'm, I'm, I'm a Brooklyn kid. But oh. I, 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 do enjoy, I do enjoy the Pelicans. And, yeah, and, and I go and I go to see them. I'm torn. I lived in Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta as well. Uh -huh. So I have I've drifted enough that I enjoy the teams. The only team that I rooted against that I lived in was with the Celtics. Oh wow! Yeah. So I, when I was in when I was in Boston, I rooted for I rooted for the for the Knicks because that was my home team, and any team playing the Celtics. Yeah, me too. I was never a Celtics fan. I, I, I didn't like them. The and same that way. was when Larry Bird was playing. So they were a good yeah. team. <laughs> same, same thing. I, I have the same passion about Duke and Boston for some, some reason. I, don't, I can't explain it. It's, it's in the blood. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for your time. Uh, I enjoyed it. And just uh, admit, and thank, admit and thank you for doing this. Yeah. So, yeah, thank, I, this, this was cool. I, I really appreciate it. I, I learned. Go tell, the, go tell the story. I'm going to go tell the story. It's a good story. So, so is, is homecoming, is it official? Homecoming will be unless uh, uh, you're a physician, uh, 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 unless we really don't behave in this country and let the pandemic run over us. Homecoming will happen, yes. Okay, good. Yes, the details, I, we don't have it yet. Okay. We don't wow. have the details. There, there will be homecoming this year. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, bless you.